Welcome to Bankless, where we explore the frontier of internet money and internet finance. This is how to get started, how to get better, and how to front run the opportunity. This is Ryan Sean Adams. I'm here with David Hoffman, and we're here to help you become more bankless. David, how are you doing? Feeling a little bit more educated about block space and fee markets after this podcast with Nick Carter. Nick Carter recently put out this article called Public Blockchain Fee Cyclicality and Negative Feedback Loops. And we kind of go into what the significance of what Nick discovered when he was researching for this piece. Uh, I thought it was a, a very interesting piece and to the point where I actually read it on the Bankless YouTube. And so if you uh, are the type of listener that likes to hear things as you would be since you are hearing this podcast, I've read this article on the Bankless YouTube. And there's a lot of implications in there about what this means for DeFi because DeFi specifically has a lot of implications for what Nick is talking about in this feedback loop. So in addition to all of that, we get him on the Bankless podcast to go through some of these concepts with him together. Yeah, I feel like we've never actually done a deep dive episode, David, on Ethereum block space and particularly gas fees, like gas prices. Like, why do they rise and why do they fall? I think a lot of folks who are going bankless experience that this summer and have over the past few months. Like, you wake up and sometimes gas prices, you know, 20 guay or 80 guay, and other times it's 500, and you're wondering why. And you actually feel the downstream implications of that. Like, you know, what transactions are you willing to do at a guay fee of 20? might be completely different than the transactions you're, you're unwilling to do, I suppose, at a GUI fee of 500. And Nick provides some analysis, I would say, of the, the, the cycles of this gas fee supply, like demand primarily and the implications of that demand. So if you've never really understood um, gas fee markets, why price goes up, price goes down, uh, and how that's even related to the price of ETH, this is the perfect episode to level up on. And I think we just had a very strong example of what Nick is talking about in this article in DeFi, where you know yield farming started with comp, things started to get a little bit crazy, and then urine came around and it got even crazier, and then yams came around and it got super crazy, and then it kind of just spiraled out of control. So one day we woke up and gas prices on Ethereum were three to 400 guay, and the Ether price was pushing up on, into $500. And at that same time, uh, the, with the gas fees so high, people stopped transacting and the thing kind of all fell apart to where we are now with Ether, you know, trying to hold its head above water above 300. And Nick, Nick contends that all of these things, the, the gas markets, uh, the gas fees, the blockchain congestion and the Ether price, along with DeFi and how some of these protocols like Uniswap and, and Wiren depend on transactions in order to generate APY. Uh, and so that's that's kind of why we brought him on to the episode today to have some holistic conversation between the link between DeFi economic activity, block space demand, and block space fees. So if you're ever wondering why gas price goes up, if it will ever fall again, what these cycles mean for the innovation of Ethereum, will we have a only a whale le layer level one, or will normal folks be able to transact in a in a trustless way? This is a fantastic episode for all of that, and we can't wait to bring it to you. But before we do, we want to tell you about our fantastic Bankless sponsors. One of the tools I've started to use recently is Zapper. For those of you that were a part of the 2017 bull market, it was characterized by just opening up Blockfolio and refreshing it over and over and over again. And also, anytime you ever made a trade, you would have to go into Blockfolio and manually input that trade information to make sure that your portfolio that you think that you have matches what you actually have. With Zapper, you don't have to do any of that anymore because all you have to do with Zapper is input your Ethereum addresses and then Zapper will give you a really elegant report as to where all your money is. So there will never ever be any disconnect between the money that you think that you have and the money that Zapper reports to you. Zapper looks directly on chain and gives you a nice portfolio summary of all your assets and how many assets and your, all of your debt and all of your lending positions, all of your positions all at once. So there's no more editing your portfolio because Zapper just does it for you. 
One thing that I thought was really useful about Zappers was when I plugged my wallets in, I found that I had submitted liquidity to Uniswap forever ago, and without Zapper, I would have probably lost that forever because Zapper knows where your money is better than you do. It's also the gateway to investing your money into this ever-expanding list of available DeFi platforms like Curve, Balancer, Uniswap, Yearn. In the bankless nation, there is this growing number of money Legos and keeping track of them all is just super overwhelming, which is why you could just go to Zapper and Zapper will, will solve the problem of there just being too many money Legos to choose from. So check them out at zapper.fi, enter your Ethereum addresses and check out your portfolio and see if there's anything that you missed. Bankless nation, do you want to go fully bankless, but in the real world? Monolith is the DeFi account that you need. It wraps your ETH address in a bankless Visa card and it does so much more. It closes the loop from fiat to DeFi. So you can onboard fiat to DAI on Monolith with zero fees. Then you can convert that DAI to ADAI, which is an interest bearing savings account. Again, zero fees. And then you can spend that interest in the real world on a Visa card. So you can finally buy your cup of coffee with interest earned in DeFi. Guys, this is magic. This is the closest thing to the Holy Grail crypto card and Monolith gives you all of it. You need to download the app at monolith.xyz to get your bankless Visa card. It's optimized for European listeners. They'll be coming to the US soon. And when you get that Visa card, the Monolith card, tweet about it when you do. I love seeing people unpackaging their beautiful bankless visa cards and makes me realize that the revolution is here search monolith in the app store all right let's get to the episode with nick carter bankless nation i want to welcome back nick carter who is a frequent bankless guest now he is a crypto writer of course a venture capitalist at castle islands ventures his current twitter bio states that he is that proof of reserves guy we're going to talk a little bit about proof of reserves hopefully near the end but nick how are you doing sir welcome to bankless i'm doing great thanks for having me back on thank you for making me your your most frequent Bitcoiner guest. I don't know if that's actually true, but I'm just going to assume that. Well, last time we started with that power question of like, are you an Ethereum? And I think you kind of said yes-ish, right? So <laughs> so you belong in both camps. You made us define our terms first. <laughs> I, I prevaricated heavily on that question. <laughs> well, as long as you haven't gone back on it. All right. So um, on, on that podcast, speaking of that podcast in June that we did, uh, you talked a little bit about this, and this was a, a title of a recent article, but you predicted that Ethereans or Ethereum writ large would have to choose whether Ethereum is going to be a world computer or a financial network. Were you right about that, do you think? Not to get all technical, but technically I didn't write that headline. So <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's like the classic thing that happens uh, when you have an editor. Um, what would the headline have been had Nick Carter wrote it? Um, you know, I can dig it up. I, I had like a great, great headline somewhere. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I, it might take me a second to find it. I don't know if we want to do it. Uh, but yeah, I actually thought the, the, like <laughs> my draft headline was great. Um, Coindesk had, it, that was a good clickbait headline. I immediately yeah, I mean, clicked. I but that was like the source of some like discontent among you know, a few Ethereans that read it. It's like, you know, like with the implication that you like have to choose, obviously, like, you know, Ethereum doesn't have to choose anything. It kind of just is. Yeah. Um, my draft headline, which I liked, was resurgent fees are a stark reminder of the monetary primacy of blockchains, which I can understand that they didn't <laughs> think that would like <laughs> have like popular appeal. Much more tempered though. I, well, I exactly. And, and it's like, it's like, you know, it's kind of neutral and that's like my objective. Like, you know, these are like the first couple articles I've probably ever written about Ethereum. And uh, my objective is to be fair, you know, like that's, I want to be seen as a, a neutral operator. I don't really have a strong agenda here. I just want to describe things. Well, I, for one, like both of us, uh, have really enjoyed that you're writing more about Ethereum. It's like, it's really great stuff. Like, thanks for adding to the, uh, to the, to the writing pool here. But like, what if we take that straw man that, uh, that was the title world computer or financial network, do you think Ethereum really has to choose one or the other? Are there elements of truth in that straw man headline? I would say so. Yeah. And I never really knew what world computer meant, to be honest. So I, to me, it's like a, 
kind of incoherent term, but like 100%, I think blockchains optimize by their very nature to be, um, you know, financial networks and really to be like settlement style financial networks as opposed to payment networks. So like a narrow breed uh, of, of financial networks. But yeah, I, I am very strongly of the opinion that the financial use cases, just by sheer force of gravity, tend to win out with time. So I, I seem to remember this from reading the article. It was basically like kind of written um, partially to Ethereans saying, hey, guys, there are trade-offs here and you can't have it both ways. Is is that sort of the premise of, of the article that you can't have scarce block space and also have like non-financial, low economic density uh, you know, transactions at the same time? Or what would you say the premise of that that article was? Yeah, so that, that's exactly right. Um, and I mean, it might be possible. I mean, it is possible to kind of like Merkleize data and and you you know can use a timestamp method to compress lots of data and then commit to it and publish a small digest of that data. So you can still kind of commit to arbitrary amounts of data. But if you want the really nice qualities, you know, the nice settlement and atomicity and kind of base layer qualities that you get with base layer transactions. Um, you know, I think that's going to be challenging. So I'm, I generally tend to believe that to the extent that fee pressure exists and to the extent that block space is capped, which I think is prudent, of course, to cap block space, then you're going to just get this relentless optimization for the largest transactions, which are happiest to be fee bearing and are willing to outbid other transaction types. Me and Ryan, before we started recording, we were also talking about how the the world computer metaphor or analogy is just somewhat like nonsensical. Like maybe maybe it fit the times in 2015 when we didn't really know what Ethereum was was going to be. But comparing a world computer versus a financial network doesn't really seem like a, a viable comparison in the first place. Uh, and and I, I think you would agree with this statement, Nick, that like any and every blockchain that is successful must become a monetary or financial based blockchain. There's no such thing as a blockchain for like social media or something like that because because of the inherent scarcity of block space because you can't have infinite block space because then you just turn into a database. Uh, because there's block uh, because there's block space scarcity, it therefore uh, forces the convergence of all economic activity on that blockchain to be financial in nature. Would you agree with that take or would you amend it somehow? In, I mean, entirely. I mean, you're bidding against every other global user that wants access to the to the ledger. And uh, whomever is willing to pay the highest price, maybe they're super irrational and they really want to insert some arbitrary data. Uh, but most likely, it's if they're willing to pay a high fee for inclusion, that's because they're making a large transaction so the fee is proportionally a very small part of the transaction. Like I sent a wire today. Wire cost me $35 to send, which is preposterous. Of course, I hate legacy finance. Uh, let's go bankless, guys. Um, but uh, you know, I was happy to pay 30 <laughs> I was happy to pay 35 bucks for the wire because it was like a fair amount of money, you know, and I needed, you know, instant settlement and all those guarantees. So in that same um, vain, you know, someone who's making a hundred million dollar tether transaction is willing to pay, you know, probably 500 bucks plus for inclusion in the next block and final settlement and so on. They're going to outbid someone deploying, you know, an Aragon DAO on chain, right? That's just financial gravity. When we were in 2015, 2016, talking about like the world computer or, you know, Ether is gas. Uh, before we understood these things as we understood them today, uh, what you're saying is that Ethereum was destined to be a financial network from from day one, simply by nature of what it is. It was something that you probably could have predicted. Um, although, in fairness, you know, back in 2015, we didn't even really understand the nature of Bitcoin that well. You know, a lot of Bitcoiners thought we would get these trustless side chains, and then we kind of figured out later on that you had to make all these additional assumptions about proof of work and you know side chain operators not misbehaving and you know we didn't really understand how lightning would would play out and so on so i guess to a certain degree this whole thing is a process of experimentation but you know i, I think a, lo a lot of bitcoiners early objection to ethereum was 
hey, like some of these promises are overcooked, um, especially in light of uh, of you know of the effects of the emergent effects of, of of scarce block space. Would you say the evolution from Bitcoin as like a a payments rails or a payment vehicle to Bitcoin as a store of value reflects the same dynamic as well? Oh yeah, I mean that's a big issue with Bitcoin historically is that a lot of Bitcoiners kind of had misperceptions about about what Bitcoin was suited for. And there are all these startups that got built with the assumption that P2P base layer transactions could scale up to a global audience. And that's why we had the block size war. So we're really all talking about the same thing here. This is a kind of recurring theme, uh, you know, just co- conflicting visions of what these networks can be. And it's afflicted Bitcoin and now Ethereum's having a reckoning with it, although it doesn't seem to be you know, dividing the community as starkly like we saw with Bitcoin. Uh, but it's all the same concept. It's, hey, what are the constraints here? Where realistically should we draw the line? What are we trying to optimize for? And what's our kind of time preference? You know, do we want to unlock, you know, a marginal extra 50% of block space? Or do we just kind of bite the bullet and keep block space capped and then try and build a layered layered approach, which seems to me Ethereum is going for the latter now instead of, you know, incrementally adding block space, which I think is probably a good call. So there was this reckoning for the Bitcoin community in uh, 2017 as it realized Bitcoin would not be a payment network and like there were forks that that thought maybe maybe it would be. Yet what's interesting about Ethereum is that I, I feel like there are still uh, large numbers of the Ethereum community that will still tell you, no, Ethereum is also meant for non-financial transactions. Like what what would someone like Vitalik say about about your post? Yeah, but I was interesting. I Vitalik answered my my post uh, a series of tweets. Um, I don't think I I interact with Vitalik much, so I was kind of uh, taken aback by that. But yeah, I mean, he he told me that uh, my interpretation of his words was kind of wrong, and that uh, he really did earnestly want to you know get the internet of money or whatever down back to cents for transactions as opposed to dollars and fees for transactions and. He still wanted to create super abundant quantities of block space and uh, that it was just a matter of waiting for uh, ETH2 uh, and then maybe with rollups being kind of an intermediate solution. Uh, But Vitalik seems to be uh, defending uh, his his kind of original position on this, which is that... um, that you know, there's like a teleology to blockchains. Like transactions should be cheap in absolute terms, uh, and so it, yeah, it, in contradiction to what I wrote in the post, it, I don't think he's actually evolved his stance that much. Seems like he still really does want to produce, uh, you know, really cheap transactions and lots and lots of block space uh, through these kind of different like R and D initiatives. Why do you think he wants that? Well, it's a good question because. I mean, maybe it's like the unconstrained versus constrained vision uh, kind of thing that, uh, yeah, Arjun wrote about in a blog post a, a while back. You know, he uh, has this uh, progressive streak to him, not in a political, not in a political sense, but you know, he, he has a vision about what blockchain should be for and their the amount of inclusion that they can offer to people. Um, and I guess I'm I'm probably just I would say more pragmatic, maybe or more realistic, um, not to, not to, you know, be tr- express a pejorative or anything, but I tend to, to believe in, uh, in trying to optimize, uh, what we have and what we understand, what we kind of know, as opposed to, you know, uh, putting all of our, our eggs in, in one basket of, of, you know, sharding maybe, um, or relying on, you know, significant computer science breakthroughs to kind of take us to the promised land kind of thing. So I, th- I do think it's just like fundamentally a, a conflict of visions. I would say that I think if you and Vitalik got in a room and fleshed out some some terms and some parameters and some some bounds as to what you guys are talking about, that you might come to more of an agreement than than what we've, uh, you know, what, you know, 280 characters on Twitter can, can express. Uh, I, I would say that Vitalik, you know, couldn't couldn't disagree with, and I think I remember him talking about his agreement with a thesis that you know he- heavy valuable transactions push out lighter or less valuable ones. But what Vitalik sees is optionality with scaling and optionality with packeting of data into smaller and smaller packets. Where like even though you're still transacting on the main chain, you are doing that 
in it kind of like you know, you're on a highway, but you're on a bus with like seven, 70 other people on in it instead of you're on a car with just, just you. Right. And so you get yeah. bundled up or, and, and because of that, you know, you come off with some trade-offs where instead of being dropped off at your home, you get dropped off at the bus stop and you have to walk the rest of the way or something, something trade-offs like that where, where Vitalik kind of counts it as an L1 transaction, but there are still some other, other trade-offs that as a result of the lack of density of said transaction, that this transaction has to then therefore go through. Yeah, I, and I I think that is I, th- I, that's a view that I share. I mean, my view of, of scaling blockchains it involves removing data that's registered to the main chain, as opposed to producing more data that the block that the main chain can offer. Um, and you know, so to that end, it I think that we're pretty firmly in agreement there. Um, you know, I like that's why I advocated for uh, for batching, which is a very simple thing. Uh, but it has kind of the same effect, um, you know, putting lots of payments together in a single transaction. Bitcoin saves you a lot of that overhead. Um, and uh, that's why I'm still optimistic about side chains. I mean, TBD, if I look at rollups, rollups kind of resemble side chains in some respects. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's fundamentally how blockchains scale. They don't really scale arbitrarily by, um, you know, forcing more data through the network that obviously has really significant externalities. What's kind of interesting to me is I feel like at some level, the Ethereum 2 roadmap has sort of evolved uh, a bit more with like that notion in mind, Nick, and you might call it a Bitcoiner notion that there is kind of one main chain for settlement. Even a um, an E3 search post that Vitalik put out um, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, maybe, uh, it depends when listeners are, are listening to this about the ETH2 uh, roadmap, like almost an alternative, um, kind of a, an ETH 1.5, one and done. And basically, if, you know, for folks that aren't familiar with the ETH roadmap, what that kind of means is less urgency on a full sharded ETH2 with um, like EVM capabilities and state execution. And maybe you just get basically um, proof of work, a data vil- a proof of stake a data availability layer and you kind of uh, scale in these rollups instead and you keep almost like something similar to the eth1 dot chain as a as a settlement chain um which which has been an interesting evolution and feels a lot more like the kind of the bitcoiner feel on this have you have you read that post or like are you familiar with kind of the the evolution of the eth2 roadmap i have yeah and i can't say i'm as familiar with it as you guys are, I kind of dip my toes into the ETH2 roadmap every six months or so to see what's going on. Um, this time I finally wrote about Ethereum, so I figured that I had to actually learn about it a little bit better so people wouldn't you know, just immediately dismiss what I wrote by saying that I was an uneducated Bitcoiner, which like totally pisses me off so much. <laughs> uh, so I, I did my homework, you know? Um, and, uh, I honestly, learning about rollups was very challenging. Um, it was, it was, uh, there's a lot in there. There's kind of a lot to it. Um, but, uh, it is very interesting to see this. And I often say this, I think kind of Ethereum ideology is sort of Bitcoin ideology with a 24 month delay, um, not to be (laughs) trite uh, or kind of uncharitable, but you do notice these, um, you notice certain, ideas which are popular in the Bitcoin community, which then are manifested with Ethereum. So I would say, you know, acknowledging that governance is extremely challenging and maybe on-chain governance isn't the best idea. That's something uh, which Ethereans in the last couple of years have adopted, um, you know, um, believing in, in the the quality of fees as a really important stabilizer and um, a way to retain scarcity in kind of the units of the network, uh, you know, believing in this layered model, um, uh, you know, avoiding um, protocol funded uh, slush funds to pay, you know, finance developers, stuff like that. Um, all these things are features which I've sort of, we, you know, Bitcoiners w- were sort of preaching for a while. And then, you know, later on, you see them manifest in Ethereum, which is either encouraging or perturbing. I don't know what the interpretation is, but I, I see Ethereum culture as like slightly downstream of Bitcoin culture, not to to be like unfair about it. 
It's just like an observation. I feel like there's maybe two points of, of pushback on that, which is I I largely agree with what you're you're saying with many of the points that 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 you raised on sort of the convergence there. But one area of of non convergence has been Ethereum has always been steadfast on having some programmability and smart contracts on the base layer, which um, you know does not seem to be a a a, a Bitcoiner kind of. Uh, notion like that's that's always been rejected on on from Bitcoiners and another thing I think uh, Ethereans would say is they 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 might say like it feels like Bitcoin has kind of given up on the vision of a peer to peer money at all they're kind of scaling with with crypto banks that would be almost like the the bankless editorial criticism of Bitcoin even though at Bankless we love Bitcoin as well. Um, but it's basically like Ethereum has not given up on that scalability vision, hence pursuing technology like like rollups uh, and you know plasma and all of the various ways it has evolved. Whereas whereas Bitcoin just kind of has feels like anyway only one uh, bullet in the chamber, which is Lightning, um, and that hasn't quite taken off yet. Any any reaction to that? Yeah, I I think that's fair. I mean, Ethereum has always been less encumbered uh, when it comes to vision and uh, Bitcoiners are very adamant about, uh, you know, not including tokens on the network. You know, that's definitely uh, Bitcoin. I say Bitcoin's interested in cultivating its own UTXO set and very little else. Um, You know, so it's kind of discouraged um, the insertion of third party tokens on the network. And then of course uh, discouraged um, excessive uh, complexity or, or expressivity at the base layer for kind of safety reasons. So yeah, Bitcoin optimizes for one thing and Ethereum is uh, is much more aggressive in pursuing different value propositions. I think that's very fair and that's the chief distinction between the two. Um, on the Lightning front, I think this isn't acknowledged that much among Bitcoiners. Lightning was like a very convenient kind of, um, sorry, there's traffic outside. It was a very convenient sort of rhetorical stick to bash big blockers with as, you know, the token layered scaling system. I was never convinced that Lightning would be a panacea or salvation for Bitcoin or that even it would be the predominant popular scaling method employed in the future for Bitcoin. And uh, there's going to be some disillusionment, I would predict, you know, that if Lightning continues to not really take off uh, in the coming years, people will say, well, you know, it's a red herring. Um, You know, you guys falsely advertise lightning is the panacea here. And uh, to a certain degree, I think it was it was wrong to over index on lightning rhetorically as a way to ward off the big blockers. The correct approach should have just been to say, look, we don't know exactly what, you know, layered scaling solution is, but we do know that constraints are the mother of all creativity and eventually will develop some some you know good layered si- like systems and lightning will be one of them but it's probably not suited for all second layer uh you know models um unfortunately i think there's going to be some you know like a slight realization that you know clearly lightning's not going to take bitcoin to the promised land again i mean i could be wrong on that but it's always the issue of managing expectations when it comes to blockchains. You never want to oversell a feature. All right, guys, we're going to get into the details of Nick's article as well as how it creates a cyclical market cycle in the DeFi ecosystem. But first, we're going to talk about some of the sponsors that make this show possible. Wiren is DeFi's first self-building project on Ethereum focused on producing products for those who are interested in earning yield in DeFi. Wyern's various products are all built to suit each individual investor's preferred level of risk, from various vault strategies that leverage DeFi tokens to the safer earn system which relies on stable coins. Vaults are aggressive yield farming robots, each with a unique strategy that is designed to maximize the yield of the deposited asset. Wyern employs some of the most informed developers in DeFi to keep the vault strategies updated with the various yield farming opportunities on Ethereum. For customers who are more risk adverse, the Wyern's Earn product may be for you. 
Earn is a yield aware dynamic money market that automatically seeks the best interest rates across the various DeFi protocols and regularly migrates your deposited stable coins between the DeFi protocols that are returning the best yield at the present moment. YEARN is a system that is just a little over four months old, so things are still very much an experiment. However, this hasn't stopped people from depositing over $700 million worth of assets into the YEARN system in order to find yield on Ethereum. Perhaps the people that deposited all this money were we're tired of constantly making daily transactions to follow the best DeFi interest rates, and maybe the gas fees that they were paying ended up eating too much into their profits. With Wireign, it doesn't remove the risk of these various protocols that it leverages, but it does remove the overhead of constantly trying to make sure you're finding the best yield, and also so that you don't have to pay for gas to switch up your assets. Check out the products that Wireign has to offer at yearn.finance. That's Y-E-A-R-N.finance which they also have a nice statistics page to see what other people are doing. Your Ethereum address is a bankless bank account, but here's the problem. It doesn't have a human readable name. It's represented by this long hexadecimal string that no one can read. Unstoppable Domains has the solution to that problem. It provides a domain name for your Ethereum address. So instead of telling someone to send you funds to 0xE3BA blah blah blah, you can tell them to send funds to yourname.crypto, a domain name for your Ethereum address. At unstoppabledomains.com, you can search for blockchain domains like this and find tools to easily launch websites on decentralized web technology like IPFS. You can even have Unstoppable Domains help you manage your .crypto or .eth or even .zil domain name addresses at their Unstoppable Domains manager. Websites have domain names, .com, .org, your bankless bank account on Ethereum should have a domain name too. So go to unstoppabledomains.com, register a domain name for your Ethereum address now. Unstoppabledomains.com. We talked a bit about the, uh, the Coindesk article, World Computer or Financial Network, and I felt like the article that you more recently released on fee cyclicality was almost a follow-up to that. In a way, at least it was certainly a continuation or, or related to that original article because you got into explaining actual data and what we're seeing in the fee markets today. And you started with this really cool metaphor, like a, a governor and throttle metaphor. Can you talk about that metaphor and get into the article a bit? Yeah, so basically I wanted to explain visually what a negative feedback loop was. People talk about positive feedback loops all the time and talk about reflexivity. And I wanted to instill the visual of a negative feedback loop. So basically, this was a widget attached to steam engines that basically made them work. It made them, it gave them moderation, made them more stable. And effectively, um, it was uh, a, um, a spinning valve um, that would take rotation from a steam engine, like a rotational input. And as it rotated, these ball bearings um, through centrifugal force were, force were pushed upwards, which itself was connected to a valve which would choke off the flow of steam to the engine. So basically, the faster they spun, the more they would regulate the flow. Uh, so it's a negative feedback loop. And this basically allowed steam engines not to overheat and explode. Um, and, and it made things like the textile industry, you know, basically function. Um, so that was the baseline metaphor. And the point I make in the article is that fees are similar to that. Um, fees regulate the usage of blockchains. Uh, but maybe unlike the governor on a steam engine, they do it in kind of a, a less predictable way, maybe slightly more chaotic way. So the through line that I'm seeing in this article, your first article uh, in Coindesk, and what we've been talking about so far in this podcast, is you are on this quest to find evidence of uh, economic density uh, or transaction density, where we, we, we started talking about uh, how all blockchains that would work would ultimately become financial blockchains because of the inherent scarcity of block space. And in, in this in this particular article, you you uh, go on a, a little bit of a, a quest to actually find evidence for the thesis behind economic density of a, of a transaction. So when you were looking for that evidence, what, what did you find? More generally, I was looking for evidence that uh, 
capped block space causes interesting emergent phenomena to to result. Uh, and, and one of those is economic density. But the other ones is, the other features are, um, you know, strange oscillations and transaction count. Um, but yeah, I mean, I found a number of things. I mean, my most startling discovery probably was the fact that as fees rose dramatically in kind of late August and early September, the number of smaller transactions on both Tether, uh, on ERC-20 Tether and Ether itself dropped off a cliff. So smaller transactors just stopped transacting. Uh, And then the other thing that was really interesting that I found was a really tight correlation between fees and Ethereum terms and then the median transaction size of Ethereum and other tokens like Tether as well. So clearly there's some interesting threshold in people's minds where they're willing to pay X percent of the value of a transaction in fees. And as fees climb, the transactions they're willing to pay necessarily get larger. And maybe they defer those smaller transactions or they just choose to only make larger transactions. And I don't know what the percentage is, and I'm sure it differs for lots of people. But um, I don't know, if it were up to me, I would probably mentally peg it at 2% or something. But the point is, as fees rise, as the stakes rise of transacting on-chain, people become less willing to make small transactions than they opt for bigger ones. Or alternatively, again, I I need to collect more data on this. It could just be the the composition of transactors changes, you know, that certain people that are uh, predisposed to making smaller transactions just cease their activity altogether, and it's only the larger transactors that are left. And this isn't the only time that you had seen this behavior. This is this the first time that you had seen this behavior on Ethereum. Talk about what you saw back when you looked at the data back in uh, 2017 for Bitcoin. Well, I didn't look at it with this much specificity on Bitcoin. Uh, those are things that I specifically sought out, those data points in the Ethereum context. What I did see in 2017 was this relationship between uh, transaction count fees and Bitcoin. We saw this cycle repeat six times in 2017 you're probably going to want to look at the article to visualize it here but basically as transactions rise they drag up fees once you hit that capped block space ceiling and then the fees themselves actually moderate the transactional intensity so the fees are then a disincentive to transact and so then you have this kind of attenuation or you have a decline in the transactional intensity and then as the blocks empty out again People realize, hey, there's lots of interesting opportunities to transact cheaply on chain. They start transacting again, and then the fees rise again. And so you have this cycle that, you know, from peak to peak, the cycle lasts about 60 days on average, or at least it did for Bitcoin. Um, And there's always a latency between the peak for transactions and the peak for fees. The fees always follow the transactional peak. Um, So it's just a fascinating relationship, which I didn't see pointed out much in 2017. I pointed out at the time, it was just a curiosity. And then when fees started to really take off on Ethereum, I thought to myself, hey, maybe this is going to happen again. And maybe there'll be some interesting effects on Ethereum because Ethereum's liquidity is much more kind of on-chain than Bitcoin's liquidity was in 2017. Yeah, that's kind of why we wanted to get you onto the podcast because you know the integration of smart contracts and native financial activity changes up this cycle. And so, j- just to reiterate the cycle um, super clearly, the the cycle begins at, at one part in the loop. You know, we'll we'll just start with there's there's some amount of block space demand, and as demand increases the overall uh, transaction count uh, increases or, or transactions increase, therefore there's more demand. And when this happens, the fees go up, right? And when the fees go up, the smaller players uh, are incentivized to uh, transact less. And, and in your article, you call this, you know, it, it turns out that transactors on Ethereum are very sensitive to fees. Uh, and so people that are sending some amount of value don't want to pay a above a certain ratio of that value in fees and and transactors are very sensitive to that. Therefore, when fees go up, these people uh, who are sensitive to this stop transacting and then the transactions decline 
and then the block space starts to empty out and the fees decline. And then once the fees decline, there's incentive to purchase that block space again because the block space is therefore cheap. Uh, but what you what you alluded to in your article is that when DeFi, there is so much native economic activity that is possible that it, it changes the game. And you specifically talked about uh, how Ethereum has so much Ether liquidity on chain, whereas in Bitcoin in 2017, you know, Bitcoin price discovery is uh, found in, uh, on centralized exchanges where there isn't actual transactions on the main blockchain. So in your view, how does the the fact that liquidity for Ether, the, the native token and other tokens on Ethereum, how, because it exists on chain in DeFi, how does that change up the cycle? Yeah, so this is really the key. I don't know if I want to say finding, but this is probably the most important takeaway, I think, um, is that in a network like Ethereum, which itself is like an enormous DEX, you know, you could probably describe Ethereum as a big clearinghouse for value between various mm -hmm. tokens and ether itself you know with ether acting as that liability free kind of reserve collateral you know it's the base pair for everything else um and since so much liquidity is on chain i mean we have uniswap flipping in coinbase in terms of volumes so much liquidity is on chain all of these transactions require on-chain settlements um you know that effectively means that the fee break is more is more of an effect. It ha has a more pronounced effect on liquidity and volume uh, than than the fee break did for Bitcoin at exchanges in 2017. The reason for that is to buy Bitcoin on an exchange, you have to send them a wire or an ACH deposit. You can buy Bitcoin, you can sell Bitcoin on the exchange. You know, none of that actually requires cashing out to the chain itself. You could just perform that whole process with kind of traditional banking infrastructure. Uh, and th that was just the nature of the liquidity environment in Bitcoin in 2017. Now, to participate in DeFi, which was, you know, really the big attraction this year, um, you know, a lot of that was, you know, DeFi native. You couldn't really, you know, yield farm through an exchange. You'd have to actually instrumentalize that on chain. And uh, my hypothesis or kind of presumption here is that as fees rise, you're massively raising the barrier to entry um, for these putative DeFi users. And um, they're willing to tolerate some amount of fees because the opportunities were good, of course. And, you know, there was literally free money floating around at some points with some of these uh, airdrops and it's kind of similar opportunities. But at a certain threshold in fees, those smaller kind of DeFi transactors uh, got priced out. And their bankroll just didn't justify paying, you know, a ten, twenty, fifty dollar fee to, you know, make a trade on Uniswap or something, and uh, it priced out everyone with a bankroll maybe, you know, below ten or fifty thousand dollars. I I don't have exact numbers, and it obviously depends on where the fees are, but certainly there are some smaller users that got priced out. And the point isn't to say, you know, this is unfair or anything. I'm not taking like the Roger Ver perspective where fees are like this hideous evil thing <laughs> i think fees are great yeah no i'm 100 percent in favor of uh you know fee intensity i think it gives you tons of discretion and choice as a protocol architect right the fees are an asset you know that's the chain's own revenue and you can sort of instrumentalize that in a variety of ways and that's exactly what ethereans are planning on doing so the fees are great but they also have some potentially adverse consequences in terms of pricing out some of those users um, of those kind of native on-chain DeFi platforms. And, uh, you know, the conclusions you draw from that are up to you. You could say, well, this is why we need, uh, you know, these super scalable ETH killers. Uh, <laughs> or you could say, well, that's just going to be the nature of Ethereum for now. I mean, the conclusions are kind of up to you to draw, but I really just wanted to point out this phenomenon and also encourage people to do more research on it. I think that the, the phenomenon that, that you mentioned, like bankless listeners and people who are using DeFi systems and going on the bankless journey, as we call it, like we feel that, right? I, David and I probably have, you know, hundred or more examples of this. Yeah, just, just a few that come to mind. Had a had a had uh, someone in the bankless community going bankless with a, a small amount of money. So depositing some funds into an Argent wallet, not a lot, you know, maybe $300, something in that range. 
But then when gas fees go up, it makes absolutely no sense to withdraw those funds, right? Because maybe you're paying a $50 fee or to do anything in DeFi, like take out a loan starts to require a lot of money for a, a you know, a, a small transaction, a small capital transaction. You know, David, I, I remember you have an example of doing some uh, DeFi farming at one point and just realizing, oh my God, that my farming proceeds aren't actually paying for my gas fees. So this whole thing mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. I should just stop farming. Um, Curve, man. Yeah, Curve. That's way, <laughs> yeah, way too expensive. Yeah. Right? So it's like the DeFi equivalent of the Minsky moment. Yeah, exactly. And so like we have we have tons of examples of of this. And it's particularly interesting. And I think um uh it uh it's unexpected for some DeFi users who haven't seen one of these cycles play out when they have some small amount of funds and on chain and in liquidity pools, that sort of thing. And they're not expecting a sudden rise in fees, right? Um, So they almost get a little bit trapped on chain, I might say, because then it it doesn't make sense to pull those those fees out. This happens to a lesser extent on on Bitcoin, because on on Bitcoin, you might have like wallets, let's say, with with trace amounts of, of Bitcoin that you know, the, the, the fees to move the Bitcoin from one wallet to another, it's not worth it. Costs more than the value that's inside the wallet. So you get this trace, this trace Bitcoin in all of these wallets. But on Ethereum, because it's a, a, a much more, I guess, robust and interactive financial system, a mini DEX, a mini financial system, a mini, you know, stock market, uh, in a way, it, uh, it does have some downstream effects that, that users see. And uh, aren't necessarily ready for it. And it also has effects on applications. So applications that that plan to develop on Ethereum with a certain, um, you know, gas fee, I guess, parameter or assumption, uh, they have to rearchitect to um, to plan for a higher gas fee world. So th- that's kind of what you're talking about, right, Nick? Yeah, and I'm not, you know, trying to inject much normativity or kind of prescriptive findings into the discussion. I just wanted to point out that, you know, this thing that you feel intuitively as heavy users of the DeFi system, first of all, I wanted to kind of quantify that and try and find evidence for it. And then second of all, say, yeah, there might have to be a rethinking around uh, which uh, applications uh, and kind of usage modes are possible, at least in the near term, um, you know, barring any dramatic changes in terms of sharding or, you know, new superabundant forms of block space, um, there might have to be a bit of a reckoning uh, in terms of what is considered economically viable in terms of uh, a transaction type on Ethereum. Now, of course, fees have declined since then. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot more things are possible once again. But my guess is that we do have another cycle like this. And so people will be better prepared for it now. You know, they've been through it once. Uh, but, you know, what does Ethereum look like if the, it is characterized by these cycles? Um, you know, does that challenge your assumptions about the system? Nick, in your, in your article, you talk about the link between the breaks on the system because fees are too high and the price of Ether. And I actually didn't totally understand that connection. So I'm, I'm hoping you can reiterate it here. Yeah, so this is like maybe the most speculative part of the article. Um, but if you look at the fees on Ethereum and then the actual local top for both Ether and a bunch of kind of DeFi assets, obviously the value of a, of a DeFi pseudo equity token is a function of the kind of summed discounted cash flows that end users expect to accrue to, you know, the, the decks or the marketplace. Um, and so effectively there, the value of that token is a function of the volume and the liquidity that, you know, end users expect to flow through the exchange or the, you know, interest rate swap product and so on. Uh, but with ether, the, the value of ether is to a significant extent, a function of the usage of ether as this collateral asset for DeFi and the reservation demand for Ether and kind of the induced scarcity that DeFi brings uh, to Ether itself. Uh, that's all pretty long-winded, but my mental model has Ether's value being at least partially indexed to DeFi. That's why we saw it eventually being dragged upwards by DeFi. 
uh, this year. And uh, so the, basically the hypothesis here is that the fees act as a break on uh, usage of some of these DEXs. Um, it kind of collapses volumes, not, you know, not by, you know, a catastrophic amount. I mean, volumes are still pretty high across the board. They've definitely declined uh, since kind of early September, uh, but they're still higher than they were in, you know, early August, for instance, if you look at the DEX volumes. And Nick, when you were talking about volumes, were you talking, uh, you know, nominal dollar value uh, vo- volumes or were you talking transaction volumes? Oh yeah. Uh, volumes in dollar terms. Um, they've come down, uh, since that fee peak, uh, that was also the peak for, uh, early September was the peak in the ether unit price. And for a lot of those DeFi assets, which is less surprising. Uh, but I, I do think that in this case, there might be a connection between the fee intensity and the price of, of ether. I know that's maybe a bit more tenuous. Um, but, uh, I see, I'd have to kind of do a little bit more work on this, but my intuition is that some of the ether backstopping these systems in the same way that it was kind of scooped up when uh, DeFi, you know, really exploded uh, to a certain extent, it was disgorged when uh, interest in these systems waned a little bit um, as the fees kind of took away some of the enthusiasm. Uh, So it's kind of like, if you guys remember the ICO, kind of induced scarcity effect in 2017 where you needed ETH to participate in ICOs. And that was really accretive to the price of ETH on the way up and then catastrophic on the way down as a lot of these ICOs paid salaries and divested that ETH subsequently. You see a a similar kind of related version of that same phenomenon where ETH is, you know, a lot of ETH supply is taken off the market to be employed as collateral or to be the base pair in DeFi. And then maybe as some of the interest in DeFi wanes a little bit, the ETH appears back on the market. You have this fresh supply and that puts pressure on the price of ETH. So that's basically the the hypothesis. But again, it's you know, it's always very hard to kind of evaluate uh, you know, the drivers of price. I definitely agree that that hypothesis is there. However, if uh, m- I, if I were to add something to your article that I think you missed, is that a lot of these DeFi protocols and these DeFi tokens that have valuations themselves are valuable because a transaction in the, their respective system is uh, revenue for that re- respective system's protocol and therefore the token, right? And this is uh, specifically true for Uniswap, but also for for Wiren and you know a few other other farms uh, and um, uh, yams and themselves. Uh, e- even though a transaction with a yam doesn't add much to the market cap of yams, economic activity around yams adds money into the yam treasury, right? And so. What we kind of saw with this DeFi yield farming mania is that a lot of these protocols learned to produce a treasury, which is what the excitement uh, came about from. And especially with Uniswap and Wiren, a transaction through these systems added a fee or added, took fees and added it to the protocol's treasury, right? And so you you slap on this cyclicality nature due to the, the this kind of like two market two month long business cycle in Ethereum and DeFi, and you slap on these protocols that are also generating revenue from transactions themselves in addition to the fees being paid to the L1 blockchain, and you have this secondary uh, secondary system that is kind of uh, replicative of the the primary system, uh, and so we've seen. Uh, uh, APY from Yearn or, or APY from uh, providing liquidity to Uniswap track the returns or th- those returns track economic activity on Ethereum. And so when fees get too high and the smaller transactors get washed out, the APYs for these protocols reduce. And that's kind of the APYs for these protocols are why we saw so much capital and new people and new excitement flood into uh, DeFi in the last few months was because like Yearn was offering 50% APY because everyone was using Yearn. And same thing with Uniswap. Like if you uh, you wanted to add liquidity into Uniswap because you know the banana farm was incentivizing liquidity to go there and therefore more people would trade bananas and and then the fees would get added to the Uniswap pool and the APY for the Uniswap would go up. 
Uh, but then, but then fees, and then we hit like 400 guay and everyone, like you are, you are saying with this, this article, everyone stopped transacting and kind of like how you were just talking about with the 2017 ICO mania, it's a little bit of a game of musical chairs, right? Like the only reason why the APY is there is because everyone else is trying to access the APY. And in order to access the APY, you have to make the transactions. And so it all kind of ended up falling apart. And I think that's one of the most uh, interesting things about this article and what's recent in, in the DeFi ecosystem is that uh, so much of DeFi right now depends on economic activity. And what your article is showing is there's going to be this natural break that happens every so often that's going to dampen uh, economic activity on DeFi. Yeah, I think that's very astute, and uh, you're you're pointing out the pro cyclical features that uh, you know a lot of us noticed. I I didn't really have the time to to kind of write a full analysis of that. There's a few other kind of uh, sources of reflexivity that I noticed in DeFi, um, but uh, I think people are attuned to that now. Um, I guess you know there's some potential good news though, right? I mean, and maybe we'll get to this, but uh, if you believe that. Um, your, you know, the efficiency, the economic density of transactions is going to vastly increase with some of these uh, technical innovations around the corner. Then maybe Ethereum isn't doomed to suffer these pretty vicious business cycles. Maybe the that that cycle can be attenuated. So that that that's going to be the really interesting thing that I'm going to be looking out for. I definitely see rollups as a reservoir of economic activity that you know as the L1 gets congested, like people can can flock to uh, rollups. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll talk about that later. But but Nick, in your article, you uh, use this analogy, uh, this poker analogy that kind of uh, put different characters of different poker skills around the table. And I'm hoping you could uh, go through that analogy here because I think it relates pretty strongly to what I was just talking about with the, the returns on DeFi. Yeah, very much so. And uh, the analogy is basically... Um a layperson version of Andrew Lowe's adaptive market hypothesis, which if you haven't read that paper, and there's actually a whole book about it, I uh, strongly recommend it very much informs the way that I think about markets, which is to say that market participants are heterogeneous. You know, they're very different. And uh, in DeFi, I think this is very much the case. You have, um, you know, you have really elite players, and then you have some less sophisticated uh, kind of retail punters that are involved. And uh, it's kind of the same where a poker player in a casino, you might have, uh, you know, amateurs that just want to hit the felt and uh, grinders or semi-pros or professionals. And uh, if you're a professional, you want to select the loosest table with the most fish, essentially, you know, with with the most amateur players. Um, And uh, if those amateur players lose all their money, then... uh, It's kind of less lucrative to sit there as a sophisticated player. And uh, the point here is that if you think about fees as the rake, the rake being the kind of the fee that the casino operator charges, um, although this isn't exactly how rakes work, so just bear with me with the tortured analogy. If you massively hike the rake, then players with smaller bankrolls, it's not worth it for them to participate in the game. And then the pros and semi-pros and grinders are left playing against each other, and it's kind of less lucrative overall. And that's actually what happened in online poker um, as, as it got kind of banned in the U S and people had to move offshore and it became more challenging. And a lot of those retail users, uh, had lost their bankrolls and I guess their wife or girlfriend told them they couldn't play online poker anymore. Uh, the game got more competitive and, uh, there was basically less alpha, uh, to be found. Uh, so kind of the same thing in D5, you know, you've got these, these funds that are quite sophisticated, they're active in market, um, if, if the retail users leave or defer transactions because fees get pretty high all of a sudden, uh, now it's kind of the semi-pros and the pros playing against each other, and that's kind of more challenging, and there's less easy sources of return. And uh, again, this is a little bit more speculative. I don't have a ton of data to back this up. I just wanted to build intuition as to why... Uh, why the loss of, of retail or call it uninformed flow or unsophisticated flow uh, might actually be pretty destructive to the kind of liquidity environment and make it less attractive to participate in general. 
So yeah, in, in the DeFi space, we saw you know a ton of new people come in, you know, install MetaMask, make their first purchase on Uniswap, but they weren't doing it with you know, they they didn't come in with fifty thousand dollars. Probably they probably came in with a few hundred, maybe a thousand, maybe a couple thousand, so, something relatively smallish. Uh, and you know because they heard about some DeFi token that was going to moon, and they wanted to go to Uniswap to, to purchase it. Uh, and but then we have like these you know very very um we have these very experienced you know firms these very experienced whales that have been in DeFi, have been in ethereum for years now who are you know crypto native and, and have all their wealth in in crypto and they just have the advantage right and so as soon as gas goes up to you know 300 guay the the people that just came in for to make a quick buck with a couple hundred dollars on uniswap just get priced out and the only people remaining are just the DeFi whales. Nick, you, you made a, another, I guess, a fallout for, for, from the article or uh, some some speculation. Uh, and this relates to something something that Kyle uh, Samani talked about called DeFi's invisible asymptote. So, is there some kind of an invisible asymptote here, kind of a um, a ceiling that DeFi can't get through due to scalability on the base layer? Yeah, and I wish I'd, um, and a couple of people pointed this out to me, and I feel like maybe I should have referenced this in the article, but the truth is I hadn't seen that one before I wrote this. Um, but I guess I, I'm, so Cal's view is, is, you know, to the extent I understand it, is that, well, this is why, this is evidence for uh, creating a, a new base layer blockchain with a lot more capacity and then building DeFi there. So the reaction to this, so-called asymptote is probably where me and Kyle differ. I'm probably of the opinion that that constraint is the mother of creativity. And if it weren't for the constraint, we would never learn or we wouldn't be incentivized to build efficient systems that that try and increase density. And uh, increasing transactional density is the whole game here, in my opinion, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that's the challenge. That's what rollups seek to address. That's what side chains would address. That's what any deferred settlement system or sub ledgers, you know. And you've, if you look how the the traditional payments infrastructure works, it kind of works like that. You know, you have ledgers uh, nested within each other and layered on top of each other. Uh, you don't have everything settling to the same exact ledger or database. Uh, you've got layers and layers and layers. And that's how I expected to go with public blockchains. Uh, that the the base layer probably does resemble a settlement layer, uh, and then you have these um, you have deferred settlements or batch settlements. Um, and to me, that's the kind of roll up idea. Now the question is, can you reconcile that layered model with the really nice qualities of DeFi? That's really the big critical question, in my opinion. Or do you need final settlement? for each transaction, uh, kind of immediate final settlement, base layer style final settlement for DeFi to work. And I don't know, that's that's the question I would pose to the Ethereans. Um, can you roll up a FI, a DeFi contract, and have it feel the same from a UX perspective as the default way that they work today? Um, and if that's not possible, I don't think that's the end for DeFi though. I just mean, I just think what it, entails or implies is that the average transaction size will just be structurally pretty high and it just won't be as suited for retail usage. Um, but, you know, Ethereum can always produce more block space, for instance. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think, let's say there is an invisible asymptote. Awesome I don't think that dooms DeFi. I just think it means that uh, you're, you're, you know, it's more suited for kind of larger style transactions. It seems like, and I, I'm going to grossly oversimplify, I think, but like uh, there are almost three schools of thought on this, right? As to where where the transactions ultimately go. So everyone who's been priced out of settlement on a main chain like Bitcoin or Ethereum, well, where do their transactions go? And if I'm understanding something like Kyle's uh, take is that, of course, they go to a new blockchain that maybe I own a portion of, but a new blockchain with, that has solved the scalability issues and is much faster than Ethereum and has uh, very high transactions per second, right? So that's one school of thought um, that the transactions move to a better layer one with higher transactions per second. The Bitcoin school of thought, in the absence of something like a lightning or some way to scale with 
uh, base chain security uh, is m- those transactions might move to a side chain or uh, to crypto banks, essentially, to exchanges that then uh, settle, use Bitcoin as a settlement layer on chain. I think Ethereum's hope is sort of this third school of thought that, again, um, you know, constraints are sort of the mother of invention here, that roll-ups will be that that scalability layer. So that essentially uh, technology like roll-ups and state channels and 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 plasma, but, but mostly roll-ups seem to be coming to the forefront, will be a... Um, a way to use these transactions and scale these transactions with the settlement guarantees of the base layer and there, thereby still preserve this idea of a decentralized bankless um, you know, transaction layer. I think that's kind of Vitalik's hope, right, that that, that will happen. W- what's your take on those three schools of thought? Do you, do you agree with, with uh, the way I laid that out there? Yeah, I think that's a very fair characterization. Uh, obviously, Bitcoiners are, are heterogeneous, as are Ethereans. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I'm still holding out hope that um, Bitcoin is able to uh, scale in a, in a more trustless way. Um, obviously, I'm trying to persuade exchanges to reduce the amount of trust that we have to put in them, you know, the kind of variety of methods we can talk about. But also, it would be great if uh, we could continue with this kind of uh, increasing uh, economic density on Bitcoin as well. Uh, so I, w- I'm, I haven't, you know, fully given up hope that we that we uh, that we can scale trustlessly with Bitcoin too. But yeah, I, I think your characterization is pretty complete. In effort of keeping L1 security but having scale, uh, you started your article off with the, the metaphor of the governor, right? Where there are these weighted balls, and the uh, energy from the steam engine spin the balls around. And as the balls spin slower, the the, the, the valve uh, closes, and as it spins faster, the valve opens, and th- this uh, finds natural equilibrium with how to govern the steam engine, right? And you're connecting this to the cyclicality of fees on a blockchain, where fees go up, people stop transacting, then when people stop transacting, fees go down, and then people start transacting again. But there's a, a number of L2 solutions, which I think can act as reservoirs of this energy, right? And so like the balls on the governor, they're weighted, but they're still relatively small. And so an alternative model of a governor exists called a flywheel, where a flywheel picks up the energy of the system persistently when the energy is created. And then when the energy dissipates, you can tap into the energy supplied to the flywheel in order to keep the energy in the system moving forward. And this is how hybrid vehicles work, right? So when you're driving your Prius and you hit on the brakes, the energy gets captured from that braking and gets put into the battery. And then when you later, when the red light turns green, you put your foot back on the gas and the energy in the battery goes into the engine to move the car forward. And so as Ethereum is generating this economic activity, it also uh, generates its own brakes. But with roll-ups, roll-ups can act as this L2 reservoir of reservoir of more transactions, right? And so as as the block space in the L1 becomes more and more in demand and pushes out smaller transactors, well, they can go and run to optimism and optimistic rollups where there is basically infinite block space because uh, because of, of how rollups work and, and how optimism works. And they can get onto the optimism chain and, and transact on the L2 and kind of wait for the tide to go back out, right? And, and I think a, a, an optimistic centric view of Ethereum has this natural flywheel effect where the energy boils on the Ethereum main chain and it pushes energy into the optimistic rollups. And as the main chain releases its energy, the act- activity back from the rollups goes back into the Ethereum main chain. Is that is that kind of how you see rollups as a, a system or do you kind of just see it as a, a scaling solution? No, I think that's that's very well put. And uh, from my my uh, kind of investigation into rollups, I had a similar conclusion. I think that um, I don't know if it's going to be ZK rollups or optimistic rollups that are more popular, but I do see them as a reservoir for those on-chain transactions to the extent the chain is congested. I think the really salient question is, what is the nature of a transaction on a rollup? Specifically, what are the settlement assurances of a rollupized transaction as opposed to a base layer transaction? And how easy is it to 
you know, make those transactions kind of interoperate with with other related systems? Do they have the same composability guarantees? That's kind of the number one question I have. Um, you know, what what are the prospects for mm-hmm. rollupizing, you know, whole, wholesale DeFi contracts and making them communicate, uh, you know, clearly and efficiently? Um, but yeah, I mean, it, certainly the vision of rollups uh, seems pretty compelling to me. I guess the question is how it interacts with DeFi in practice. I do know that the ETH online event that is currently going on right now, that there are, are a number of teams trying to figure out how to find workarounds for the withdrawal period, making rollups, you know, a step in the right direction when it comes to having, you know, similar capabilities and assurances and guarantees as the L1 blockchain. But you're totally right. It is uncharted waters that is currently in research phase right now. Yeah, that was kind of my conclusion from looking at optimistic rollups specifically. ZK rollups are a little more black boxy to me, and I haven't really understood them completely. But with OR, it seemed to me like I wouldn't consider an OR transaction final until that you know unhappy case period had elapsed. Uh, even though most transactions won't have to, you know, the, you'll have the happy case where there's no conflict or anything. Um, so to me, that like seems slightly different from you know, your standard Ethereum transaction, which maybe settles, you know, in a few blocks. I agree. It's kind of like it's pseudo, it's pseudo settled until then. Um, can we, t- can we talk about something else? So, so some people listening to this, to this podcast are like, Hey, like what's the deal with expanding, um, block space to just handle this, right? Some chains have done that. How are other chains handling this problem? So it seems like Bitcoin and Ethereum are similar in that they've said, Look, there are constraints on the amount of block space that we have in a given uh, time period. Um, but other chains talk about you know free free gas, like no gas transactions, or uh, super high transactions per second where the gas is cheap. And you know many of these are labeled um, Ethereum killers and that sort of thing. But do, do you have any thoughts on? or a critique of other chains that are advertising low or, or zero gas fees? Yeah, I mean, frankly, no other chains have meaningful levels of usage so, such that we can evaluate their claims uh, empirically. You know, so plenty of other chains made, you know, gas or block space effectively free. And so they kind of subsidized block space and made trade-offs on validation. And then they had a lot of transactions, but it wasn't, really economically relevant if you actually look at the composition of these transactions it's kind of like junk data being inserted uh so we haven't really seen any of these other alternatives tested in the wild um but yeah my my stance on this is is pretty consistent i i think metering resources using fees as that uh that kind of gating function and keeping block space scarce really is the way to go here um and I think in the long term, you're going to have great returns from maximizing economic density of transactions, as opposed to just naively trying to increase block space and making validation really costly, which to me, you get back at the same same traditional financial system where you have a handful of super nodes that control everything. And that doesn't really seem uh, very new or interesting to me. Yeah. And so why is it important for anyone to be able to run a node? Well, the, the, we're getting to like, you know, the, <laughs> you know, the, the, the philosophical fundament of blockchains here. And I guess it, it probably depends on your perspective, but I think the whole point of these systems is that you can participate in them without too much trust required. And you can audit the supply of these assets and you can verify that an inbound payment is genuine. Uh, you know, you can reduce the cost of counterfeiting very low uh, or the cost of detecting counterfeiting. So to me, the blockchains are all about, first of all, they're monetary in nature, and then they're all about verification, uh, verification that a transaction is valid. And uh, if you can't do this as an individual, then you're probably going to get taken advantage of at some point. And if we want to render the hierarchy flat, I think we have to make nodes cheap or at least reasonably cheap to operate. Uh, so that's kind of my stance always has been, um, you know, like people give Ethereum shit for the cost of running a node, but I've certainly seen 
much pricier nodes out there, uh, which are virtually impossible to run even on, you know, really high end uh, enterprise infrastructure. So Nick, this has been awesome to understand your thoughts on kind of economic density and and how those articles came together. Well, we've got you. We want to do some, get get some of your quick takes in like a a lightning round, or as David and I sometimes call it the roll up round. (laughs) So um, the first is this, there are now almost over, actually over a billion tokenized Bitcoin on Ethereum right now. So it's like 1% of Bitcoin's supply. What does that mean? Is that bullish for Bitcoin, Ethereum, both? What's your take? Uh, mutually beneficial. I think it's good for both chains. Uh, it's good for Bitcoin. gives uh, people a different way to uh, engage with Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I, I might question, you know, the trust guarantees of that peg and, and you know, the trustlessness and so on. But leaving that aside, um, I think it, it's... It, you know, is a interesting way to potentially transact with Bitcoin in context that you couldn't before. So I, I think it's good from that perspective. From Ethereum's perspective, you know, one problem I notice with DeFi is kind of a lack of high quality collateral to use in the system. It seems like people are trying to insert Bitcoin now because it's got, you know, fairly nice volatility characteristics maybe compared with some of the newer, more incipient tokens that exist there. So it makes for fairly good collateral too. Uh, so I, th- I think it's it's good for both systems. Recently, BitGo instituted proof of reserves. But then on Twitter, Nick, you said that this isn't that big of a deal. Uh, a, why should we care about uh, proof of reserves? And why does B, BitGo's implementation of it matter less? To me, proof of reserves means something fairly specific, which is if you are a depositor and you have a custodial relationship with a deposit-taking institution, you want to be able to verify that they a have assets corresponding to your liabilities that the IOU that they owe you and b that your um, your liabilities included in that kind of attestation. Um, so you want them to prove your assets, and then you want them to prove that they specifically have uh, a claim uh, or that you specifically have a claim on those assets. So that's just like a pedantic point. That's what proof reserve means to me. Maybe it's gonna get this more general, uh, you know, definition. Uh, to me, the Bitco situation is like you're comparing an on-chain, um, you're just comparing one blockchain to another. You're comparing the supply of some UTXOs on Bitcoin to uh, supply of tokens on Ethereum that are a claim on those UTXOs. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call that a proof of reserve. That doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that it's kind of a different process. Um, maybe you do need an intermediary there to obscure the specific UTXOs where Bitcoin is custodying the coins. I don't know the specifics there. I haven't really looked into it. Um, I think it's elegant and good that all you have to do to ensure the trustlessness of that system is just compare some Bitcoin balances to a token balance on Ethereum. It just seems like a different process than like the classic proof of reserve that I have in mind which is more applicable to deposit-taking institutions. Are proof of reserves and smart contracts with transparency on-chain basically converging? Are they kind of the same thing? Are they accomplishing the same purpose? Well, your classic uh, proof of reserves, unfortunately, tend to require a third-party attestation, like an auditor, basically. And there's almost no way around that because you have to account for the full liabilities of the exchange and uh, you have to kind of make sure they're not cheating. So a proof reserve in like the classic sense is not a fully trustless or kind of crypto economic operation. Whereas if you know, you're comparing balances on chain or you're auditing the uh, collateral quality for Maker, for instance, and all of that is on chain, um, that's kind of a nat- like anything that's crypto native is going to be easier to audit because that's the whole point of blockchains. Now, that said, there's always going to be these dependencies on outside systems, which is where these kind of attestations or proofs of reserve come in. Like, for instance, for Maker, if you wanted to audit the collateral quality, you'd actually want to drill down and audit the dollars in the bank accounts back in USDC, for instance. And that's when now you have a dependency on an accounting firm or you know this outside attestation. Uh, so it's kind of hard to get away from that fully. 
you know, like I think that's that's maybe like one critique some people would have of like DeFi is that it has reinserted dependencies on these like not fully trustless systems, um, like in the case of Maker, for instance. Um, whereas you know you get these really nice like risk management and auditability qualities if you are dealing solely with like crypto native collateral. Will Ethereum 2.0 be delivered as advertised? <laughs> Will something named Ethereum 2.0 be delivered? Almost certainly. Uh, I don't know. As, as currently advertised in its current specification. I mean, just based on history, my guess is that the, the specification changes again. Hmm. Um, but granted, I don't really know too much about it. So I'm not very well placed to opine on that. Last one for you, Nick. So the current, I guess, dip that we've seen so far, Bitcoin ETH, kind of a price stall uh what's your prediction does that continue or is this kind of a, a dip moment in 2020s or 2021 is going to be great it, the weird thing is that the you know crypto investors seem to be looking to macro factors and they seem to be looking what the dollar index is doing and and the likelihood of congress you know passing additional stimulus which is funny that we have these like dependencies on these outside things so we're kind of like a very small ship floating on a very large and chaotic macroeconomic sea. So like the endogenous crypto factors maybe don't matter as much. Um, so to a certain extent, it's like catalyst driven. It's like who wins the election, how aggressive, you know, is the Senate in terms of like injecting new dollars into the U S economy, uh, which is weird to think about, but, you know, generally speaking, I think, um, you know, the, the large caps are in a good position. Um, I would say ETH is probably more exposed to, you know, the the little crypto native economy. It's cultivated on its own chain, although that's already experienced significant deleveraging. So maybe it's it's going through that process right now. Um, but yeah, I it, it is weird that it's like we're looking at crypto as a bet on negative real rates and like to what extent, how deeply negative are they going to be? Um, but yeah, obviously I have a positive view on it. So recently Square just announced that they put $50 million of Bitcoin into its reserve, making it the second publicly traded company to own Bitcoin. Uh, is, but also Square is run by Jack Dorsey, who, you know, might, we might as well just call him a Bitcoin maximalist. Is this a big deal or is this not a big deal? It's not a big deal in terms of price impact. Like one marginal $50 million buy doesn't move the needle that much these days which is pretty astonishing when you think about it. But uh, it's a big deal in terms of signaling. Uh, it kind of normalizes uh, Bitcoin as this balance sheet asset. Uh, I, I mean, it's not what I would do if I was running a publicly traded company, to be frank with you, but clearly he wants to send a message to his peers, basically, and uh, send a message about his commitment to Bitcoin. So from a signaling perspective, I would say it's, it's pretty interesting. Nick, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on to talk about these concepts related to economic density, explaining your work, ex explaining your, your your articles, everything else. So glad that you are writing about both Bitcoin and Ethereum these days. David and I have got to come up with an episode title, but uh, you know something that uh, that that captures some attention. How about this one? Nick Carter says Ethereum's only for whales. How will that do? <laughs> I. See, I, uh, I, I don't know if I said that. We but, won't do that. Uh, to you. <laughs> <laughs> we will be very measured in the way I'm we present this. I'm trying to be fair to both Bitcoin and Ethereum. You know, I'm, I mean, obviously, I have like my opinions about stuff, but uh, of course, you, know, you do. You do a good job with it. Yeah, yeah. Just kidding. You, you do a great job, and it's always fun to have you on, Nick Carter. Thank you for coming in front of the Bankless Nation once again today. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. My pleasure once again. All right, guys, uh, actions and resources, two follow-up articles that we will include in the show notes. One is uh, Nick's Coindesk article about the world computer and the financial network that he did not name, uh, but is great reading material. The second is the article that we talked about for the majority of our time with Nick about fee cyclicality in Ethereum and uh, also with Bitcoin. We'll also include a link in the show notes to the adaptive markets hypothesis um, paper that Nick mentioned from Robert Lowe. So make sure you dig into that as well. Finally, 
we need some more five-star reviews from you on Apple iTunes. David, we're doing well, but uh, we need a few more, right? We are going to get the Bankless podcast to the top of the iTunes charts as DeFi grows. But the, in order for us to get that done is we need those five-star reviews. So if you could go to wherever you listen to podcasts and give us those five-star reviews so we can grow the Bankless Nation, we would really appreciate it. All right, guys, risks and disclaimers. Of course, Bitcoin is risky. ETH is risky. Crypto in general is risky. You could lose what you put in. None of this was financial advice, but we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. Thanks.